Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's AI in Healthcare Talk. And it's organized by Magnumine Academy. So you can go to uh, Magnumine Academy website and YouTube channel or Facebook channel to see this and um, other events. You can subscribe in YouTube channel. We have all the recordings of previous, previous talks and other workshops and lectures. And this event itself is broadcasted in, broadcasted in six channels. And we have, I'd like to also thank our organizers like Thomas, NS, April, Hussein. There are a lot of people working on to make this event happen and other events. I'd like to thank them. And we have, uh, this is our sixth, this is our fifth event and is a, is a AI talk. So we're gonna have more coming next August. Probably. It will be in every week in August. So I hope you will enjoy that. So um, I introduce myself. My name is Murat. I am co-founder and CEO of Magnumine. And also I am co-founder CSO of SmartLens. Uh, SmartLens is a biotech company where uh, our biotech company in ophthalmology, we make contact lenses for eye pressure measurement. And I also, I'm a, Stanford, a scientist at Stanford. I work on several projects and most of them with Shirag. And I will let Shirag and Ryan introduce themselves. All right, I'll go first. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Ryan Spittler. I direct the Precision Health Integrated Diagnostics Center um, at Stanford, as well as the Canary Center for Cancer Early Detection. And my name is Shrak Patel. I'm a uh, neuro-oncologist uh, in clinical practice and in the departments of uh, neurology and radiology at uh, Stanford, um, focusing my lab's research on glioblastoma. So great for introduction. I will make the introduction for Abdul <clears throat> myself, and then he can do more introduction on himself. So you can test how good at introducing you. I am. Gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Abdul Hamid Alabi heads up the NVIDIA Healthcare startup driving business growth and innovation into medicine and medical devices. Just let everyone know that NVIDIA uh, is the actual leading uh, company that I've been following last five, six years. And they have been doing a lot of interesting, amazing things. And it just came across this year that they are into healthcare, which quite strike me. And I liked, I wanted to learn more about it and Abdul is gonna talk about it. And uh, Abdul has been the for forefront of advanced technologies and AI in HPC for several decades, working with top global, global thought leaders, world-class organizations, such as the American College of Radiology to bring AI to healthcare. Abdul launched the NVIDIA's health platform co called Clara to reach thousands of developers and deployment sites, which I'm really interested to hear. He's gonna talk about it, uh, what it does. He also grew the NVIDIA's healthcare industry presence to a healthy nine-figure and accelerating business. Abdul pioneered key concept of intelligent medical devices and hospitals of the future. Prior to this role, he was a leader within the NVIDIA's engineering organization where he led the hardware design effort of the mobile processor powering NVIDIA's drive platform. So this really great transition you had. I can tell you that 60% of our audience coming from engineering and data science background, and they wanna definitely hear your transition as well and what you think of healthcare. So can you please just introduce yourself at first, maybe talk about the Clara and also your transition experience, then we're gonna start asking questions. I'd love to. Thank you for the introduction, by the way, it was, it was perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm really humbled to be amongst you guys. Thank you so much for this invite. It's um, a phenomenal platform to kind of share uh, what we're doing and how I ended up here actually, and I'm really excited about it. So um, I think you covered it well. I, I had the opportunity to work at NVIDIA for the last 16 years, which has been really phenomenal. And a lot of people know NVIDIA from the gaming world, right? So you play a game, you got NVIDIA, 
Um, your kids play a game in my case, they use NVIDIA. The, the general message is, is keep them going. It's good for health. So <laughs> and I know it's not what you expect to hear, but in reality, it turns out that gaming really is um, um, a wonderful tool that has pushed the technology, the compute technology so far. Right. The, the fact that you are able to model the world so realistically to be in a virtual world, turns out require a lot of compute to happen. It needs very, very strong um, connections also between AI and compute. And it's pushing both at the same time and visualization. And, and what we ended up realizing in 2012 is when AI came about that AI and the way that the algorithms are written use actually the same math constructs that gaming uses, right? So if you imagine yourself sort of in a, in a game, what you're doing is let's say you, you push an object forward or you're trying to move from one place to the other. And what, what that entails underneath is basically vector um, multiplication because you've got an object and you apply force to it and you get a new place. That's just vector multiplication and matrix multiplication. And that's really the basis of a lot of what we do instead of GPU computing and we accelerate. And, and you know, while, while a regular computing platform can do maybe 20, 30, 40 of these multiplications in parallel, GPUs can do about 5,000 in parallel, 10,000 in parallel. And, and because it turns out that a lot of the, the AI and deep learning math is also of the same nature and has matrix multiplications inherent to it, we were able to accelerate and make it run significantly faster. So instead of spending three months, you know, training something, a network or two months training a network, you can do it now in a matter of hours. Um, and this was just the beginning back in 2012. Um, and since then we've accelerated things significantly faster. So, so this is how AI came about and how it sort of merged into NVIDIA and why we've been able to contribute. We continue to invest in that space. But what a lot of people don't know is healthcare has had actually a lot to do with NVIDIA's um, history and, and how we've developed as a company, right? So when, when we were in, in the beginnings of NVIDIA, we were sort of on the display side. How do we help with graphics? And actually healthcare, and if you think of, you know, these 3D ultrasounds, when you see the face of a baby, that's actually done on GPUs. Um, that reconstruction, taking this 2D data and slices and then reconstructing them into a shape that every one of us would love to see is, is something done on GPUs. But what's really interesting is this, the moment that we switched from being just a graphics processor to being a general processor was driven by healthcare actually. So it was on a trip that our CEO had to Martino Center when he saw physicians working and, and essentially what they were trying to do is called it's a CT reconstruction. So with CT, you, you get a lot of data when, with uh, computer tomography that is. Um, where you get actually a lot of data from the scanner, right? And it's sort of like X-ray data and signals and stuff. And you wanna reconstruct them into an image. Um, and at the time that reconstruction was, you know, worked, worked just well, it, it's called back propagation at the time and it worked well, but it took a very long time or you had to expose the patient to a lot of um, um, X-ray, which was not necessary really and radiation. So there was a new method called iterative reconstruction and, and that reduced the, the exposure by about 80%. And the scientists at the time were trying to actually implement it. It just took a very long time. So it wasn't, it wasn't reasonable. It took you know, much longer than you're, you're willing to keep the patient in the scanner. So the scientists found out that, okay, we've got this GPU that can do it and it runs 5,000 things in parallel. And that sounds like a great thing. They started programming iterative reconstruction using the same programming language that graphics designers would use. So place an object here, move an object there which really didn't, didn't make sense, but it actually showed them that this was really promising. And this was the time when actually we decided to produce uh, CUDA as a general programming language. That's very much like C, where you can go and program anything on the GPU. So they now started programming um, iterative reconstructions using just regular programming language. They didn't have to use OpenGL or the display languages. And, and that's when NVIDIA pivoted from just being a, a display and graphics company to being actually a general compute company. Today, most of the supercomputers in the world actually have NVIDIA GPUs inside of them for scientific computing. Um, things like molecular dynamics, quantum chemistry, 
um, a lot of drug discovery. The first time the HIV capset was actually simulated was on a GPU. Um, the the you know cryo EM and all the innovations that came out from it were were possible because the acceleration was done on GPUs. Every time you get into a CT scanner, MR scanner, ultrasound scanner, that experience is really supported by GPU computing, making a lot of the functionality that we see today possible. So so that was sort of our journey, you know, into the company. And then when we switched to AI, one of the first, you know, to being an AI company, and we focused on that. One of the first things that, that we worked on were related to healthcare. So some of the first use cases of AI were in healthcare. People trying to do bone aging was one of the first algorithms that came out, right? So we've got, and Stanford had an amazing, you know, Safwan Halabi and, and the rest of the team over there had a great contribution to healthcare by showing that, okay, AI can be used actually to do things that are mundane for physicians. Um, and, and, and that was a really phenomenal move. And, and we've been in there from the beginning. So as soon, that was sort of when I switched, you asked me about my career at NVIDIA. I'm a computer engineer by training. Um, and when I was at, I have an MBA and at Stanford, I worked on my master's and I started my PhD um, in machine learning and decision analysis. And I started focusing on cardiovascular disease actually under Professor um, uh, Howard. And what happened is, as I sort of saw the AI movement come through and NVIDIA focused on, okay, we're not just gonna be a general AI platform, but we would like to show the people how you could use AI in a practical manner. And, and there was nothing more important than saving lives. And because we were not a healthcare company, self-driving made a lot of sense. So we focused a lot on self-driving. Today, we partner with, you know, um, over 400 uh, companies in that space, with, you know, like Mercedes Benz and, and others that are building self-driving and, you know, even everybody they could think of is using a part of our platform today for that. But what I saw at the time is um, I had a family incident and, and we dealt with cancer. And, you know, if I could see everybody here and I asked who's, who's known somebody that's dealt with cancer, most of us have, right? Even a close friend or a family member. And it really killed me to see um, the process go through, right? I mean, we missed an opportunity for early diagnosis. We, we uh, misdiagnosed the disease. We gave them the, the wrong treatment that, that, that put them in the hospital for a week. And, and I thought, oh, this, this, this is probably, this is horrible for us as a family. But it, it seemed really even worse when I learned that this is actually the norm in healthcare. You know, the Institute of Medicine showed a 5% error rate. My, my wife is a pathologist. My whole family is physicians right now. Brother is a cardiologist. Father-in-law is an orthopedic surgeon. Sister-in-law is an ophthalmology. So, so I've got a lot of view into sort of healthcare and what happens with it. And it's just the norm. I mean, they're doing the best that they can with a massive amount of data, right, that's out there. And, and they're trying to really figure out in the next 10 minutes, the history of this patient and what is the best procedure that they could operate, you know, for that patient, what is the best treatment, what is the best diagnostic uh, tool that they should use. And, and they do a phenomenal job and I really appreciate all of it, but they could use help. I mean, just the same way that, that you know, I use computers to calculate everything, the same way that we rely on Excel for a lot of things. Physicians haven't been provided with the tools, I believe that they deserve, given the difficulty and the challenge of the problem that they have. And, and one of the reasons that this hasn't happened is in the past, every tool that we needed to create was created by, you know, you, you gotta really understand what the tool needs to do and how to do it and perfectly describe it so that a three-year-old can actually understand it. And then someone else can go program it, okay? So, so I'll take pathology as an example. We, we, you know, if you wanted the computer to come in and start counting cells, you actually need to go and describe what the cells look like, right? And if you open a textbook, it says, oh, it's a circular shape, blah, blah, blah. But that's never true almost in reality, right? There's always something different. It's biology. I mean, we, we it, it's not describable the way that we, that computers would like it to be described, which is what made it very difficult for a lot of these algorithms to develop to the level of quality that was required so that the physician could trust them to do some of the work that, that needs to be done. AI changed that, right? So instead of us now basically learning everything and then being able to describe it in a perfect manner, right? Um, 
we can just show examples to AI, right? And, and that's exactly what happened, right? People started and pathology was one of the first places and um, Andy Beck from Path AI released the first paper, for example, in that space that showed you can actually train a computer to recognize cancer cells, right? And, and give the physician information about where to look on a slide, right? And be able to, and when you put them together, when you put the, it's not a replacement, but when you put the pathologist with the computer together, and, and after pathologist was, was done, it said, oh, you, you might want to look in that corner. He was able to reduce that error rate of 5% by 85%, right? So we're down to like 1% error rate now. So, so I think AI has given us the opportunity that to, to really change the field. And that's what excited me. That's when I started working with, with our leadership and I said, okay, this is what we want to do. We want to go and build AI for healthcare, just like we did for um, self-driving. And, and the first thing was to go and, fit and understand that this is an ecosystem play, meaning there's a lot of players in this game. You need the, the scientists and the researchers to continue developing the methods that you would use for AI. Um, and, and MECA is one of the leading conferences that does this today. You need the, the, the initial focus was on radiology because it was already digital and there was a lot of images. So we need the physicians to be involved because um, a lot of what you do in that space sort of bringing AI really requires the guidance of the physician because um, what we also saw with AI is um, it's sort of a change. Like in the past, you you had the, 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 you had to define what you're trying to do. And then a lot of the time was spent in computer science trying to create that model. Today, there's a shift, right? Where the actual, the actual algorithm is written, right? So we've got sort of deep learning algorithms. The networks are sort of defined. And a lot of the innovation is on the, on the data side, right? And trying to, to create the right data. And essentially it's transferring the knowledge of the physician into an algorithm that we could use, right? So, so, so that's what, what happened right there. And, and that's why we engaged a lot with the academic community. And through that, we learned about the needs of a platform in order to do um, AI. So I'll take a pause. I can continue, but I'm happy to continue description if you'd like. But do you have any questions so far? Or? Well, it's crazy. A lot of good information we are observing at first. Uh, so uh, I think okay, so quite if you would like, yeah, if, if you'd like, like, basically, essentially, I haven't described Clara. If you want me to jump into that while you get your questions. Yeah, yeah, there. please. Yeah, that would okay. be great. So, so what was really um, obvious there is, you know, as we started addressing problems in healthcare, healthcare had a different need, right? It has different requirements for AI, right? As you sort of develop it. And one of them is if you really truly want the physician to be engaged and we're saying that the programming model has changed and now they have opportunities to contribute to more than just their patients, you need to make it reasonably easy for them to, to take care of their patients as well as start contributing to AI. So, so that was one of the first missions of Clara that we built and it's named after Clara Barton, um, founder, the founder of the American Red Cross. So, the, the first thing that we did is we created ways where we had AI assisted annotation. So instead of the physician sitting down and saying, oh, this is cancer and spending time kind of annotating everything, we actually had AI watch the physician as they were annotating. And AI would start pre-annotating on their behalf. And the more that they work, the less work they actually had to do eventually, right? And, and that was kind of one of the first things that we did. The, the second thing that we did is we, we realized that there's this massive opportunity to create um, AI. However, when, when a physician looks at the data, they're really looking at the human being in 3D, right? I mean, you're thinking that our body is all 3D. It turns out that a lot of the AI that was already on the market, uh, if you think about Google and how they're using AI, it's running on images. If you think about Netflix and how they're using AI to recommend movies to you, it runs on 2D. Even self-driving is running on 2D in, in video we needed to create a lot of tools to support 3D imaging. You know, if you wanted to really look at the human being in 3D and realize that, oh, a, you know, a CT slice right here 
is relevant to a CT slice right there, then you needed to think of the whole thing together. So we created a lot of tools that enable 3D imaging. Um, in fact, we, we proved out these tools by winning the um, um, last year's RSNA. We actually won the, or, or Mikai rather, one of the Congresses. We won um, the challenge for the best algorithm to identify glioblastomas, right? In an MR scan, for example, and segment them and measure them. So, so that was kind of the second thing that we worked on, right? How do you support 3D? But then what we realized was really interesting in healthcare, which is you need the, in a way you wanna create this, you know, generalizable model, right? AI has a problem, like you can go and train it and it, it's basically having this amazing uh, memory, right? You show it enough things and it just memorizes them, right? It's so good. Now, if that works really well, if the next set of images or the next set of patients that it's going to look at are of the same um, uh, group of images that you've seen, but we know that's not the case in healthcare, right? So, so if that's not the case in healthcare, how do you show AI enough cases and enough examples that it can actually generalize and, and give you good information the next time you query it? Um, and, and that's why we, we, we also want to realize, so, so that's nice. Okay, so we want to create this massive data set looks great that has every cancer. The, the beautiful thing about us is cancer is rare. Okay, it's still, even though it's common, we see it in all the people, it's still a rare disease, right? So you don't see enough examples of cancer and all different kinds of cancers on all different kinds of people right, in each institution. So the data is actually distributed by nature, right? So, you know, Stanford will see some, UCSF has some cases and, and, and that's not new. I mean, that's why we have all of these collaborations when we do research. So what we created is we created a platform and an example that, that allows you to do something called federated learning. So bringing all of this data together is very, very difficult because of regulations and, and HIPAA and so on. So what we did is we created a platform that allowed you to actually send the model to the data. And the model goes and learns at each one of these hospitals about, about the data within this hospital and, and, and then comes back and creates this generalizable model. Looks great. We needed to add one more thing, which is privacy preserving. If that model went into this hospital, and it came out. When you query it, you don't want it to tell you the exact same, the exact information about each patient inside of this hospital, right? You want it to tell you a trend about that patient population, which, which is something that we really implemented. Very important for healthcare, I think, in order to preserve the privacy of everybody. And, and that sort of allowed us to create these generalizable models. We showed examples of them working with NIH and MGH, and, and the results were really phenomenal. And then, and then the next thing that we built inside of Clara is, well, it's fantastic that we're trying to create these generalizable models, but there is something to be said about inserting prior and in, in, into, into my own judgment. So I, if I live in the Midwest, I've got a prior on my population. If I live in California, the prior is different. When a patient comes in, I already believe that they may have that sort of disease. And it's true because there's different prevalence of, of uh, disease depending on where you come from and what you've been exposed to. So what we did also create is we created a tool for transfer learning. And what that allowed you to do is as a physician, take an existing model or as a research organization within a hospital, take an existing AI model and localize it for your own population. If you will, overfit for that population, which is a great thing, actually. That kind of gets you closer to precision medicine, Brian, right there. Right, so you don't want to use a generic model for everybody, but hey, you're a great general, you know, oncologist. But remember, this population has a coal plant next to it, so it's more likely that you know this is happening. So you can actually build these things. And then I think the final thing that we built into Clara at the time was the ability to actually deploy these um, algorithms, because one of the challenges is you can go and create all of these AIs as much as you want, but unless you find a way to embed them in the daily routine of a physician in a way that is um, you know, thoughtful and useful to them, but also in a way that's manageable from a cost perspective, efficient, that allows you to bring the hundreds of AIs that we're gonna need, it's not just one, um, things won't work. So we created that part as well um, inside. So, so that was sort of our Clara imaging and we created it and then we did the same thing for genomics, we did the same thing for smart hospitals, including EHR. We did the same thing now for COVID-19. 
focusing a lot on how do you detect disease as early as possible with thermal cameras, smart cameras, how do you enable um, the, the how do you enable nurses, for example, to monitor breath rate of a, of a patient remotely? And it's all working with the, with, the, with the community around us, right? We create the tools, if you will, and then they create the applications on top of these tools. So I'm going to truly pause now. So let's see how that went. <laughs> this is a lot of information. Great. <laughs> so first, that's really surprising for me to hear that you, you have 400 companies working on self-driving, it's amazing. Yeah. That's good news. There's, there's also, 750 companies working in healthcare AI, by the way. Startups okay, that's, that's much healthcare. better news. Yeah. <laughs> so you're doing self-diagnosis or self-treatment, what do you call it? <laughs> You know, it's uh, it's an interesting space, and I think the the reason that I switched to it is again because the impact that you can have as a scientist. And I speak to all of you who are watching this: is healthcare really needs smart people. We really need to go, and and the opportunity is just massive. The because we've created all of these tools, and it's really about applying them into healthcare, understanding the intricacies of healthcare, and then applying them there. And I think the you know what we can do is just massive. So yeah, go ahead, share. I just had one question. So, you know, it's really amazing how you're talking about this concept of federated learning where you can, uh, you know, bypass some of these regulatory um, hurdles that are, you know, in place because of patient privacy and, you know, HIPAA and other types of laws, which are really important so that you can still deploy the model. You can have it um, maybe modified or trained on a local data set. Is there a way in your computational models to somehow integrate a lot more of the data across you know, if you're if you're focusing on imaging, let's say for uh, detection or diagnosis, could you pull in then from the electronic medical record a lot of other stuff like the labs, the socioeconomic status, the insurance status, etc.? Because just as you uh, alluded to, if you're in the Midwest versus California, there's a different prior. But likewise, even within San Francisco Bay Area, for example, there are priors based on whether you're talking about a county, you know, hospital that may see patients later in the stage of their you know disease versus a, uh, a private hospital and so forth. So are there ways that we can somehow aggregate more and more of this data as inputs into, let's say, your imaging guided problem to then better inform, you know, what that prior is to then make it more of an unbiased prior? A hundred percent, yes. So so as you're sort of incorporating more, and, and that's what we're building on, and a lot of the, the technology companies are building on this idea, right? Like if I truly want to get to um, precision medicine, I have to realize one thing. A physician never looks at an image in absence, right? You don't just look at it and say, like, oh, okay, here is my diagnosis. And then, okay, I'm done. Because there's so much more about this patient that you need to know, right? And, and, and if we really want to be able to, to assist the physician in, in sort of prognostic way or diagnostic way, then we need to understand the whole history of that patient. And there's a few amazing players in this space that are trying to come after and, and help with this. In terms of the tools available, yes. So you've got tools that can read the reports of the physicians, the written reports and extract structured information out of them, what medications, what's the history. And, and those could be used as, as labels sometimes to images. So and I know you talked about glioblastoma. So, um, Brad Erickson is vice chairman of research at Mayo Clinic's radiology department. Um, also showed that AI can actually go beyond just being a tool that measures things and counts things, which is where we're, we're using it today because that's the easiest thing to do. He showed that you can actually use AI to predict genomic information out of an MR scan of the brain, right? So, so uh, you know, uh, Basically, he's able to find one P19Q codeletion, MGMT methylation information. And the way that he did it is he said, you know, I can't see it myself today very clearly, but I know that there's some information in the MR machine um, that, that, that can tell us um, about this information. So he said, let me try it. So he took all of the genomic information, he put it together with the images, and he asked the algorithm to, to go and predict um, um, the same information from the image today. And it actually predicted it over 95% accuracy. 
Um, so there is a lot of amazing work in that space. Having said that, we have to go work on it one step at a time, which is why we started with just images. And now we added the genomic information, the EHR information, even the camera information. Slowly you start adding more of the wearable information to, to build really a model that represents each patient eventually. And another question I had is, you know, with the excitement around AI, there are certainly all these other technologies and added data that you're talking about that you can layer on, like the wearables, thermal imaging, et cetera. Um, but when we talk about um, trying to generalize these principles, is there a way to start with just kind of fundamental imaging, kind of like the lowest common denominator that we know that all hospitals have, let's say, a, you know, 1.5 to 3 Tesla MRI scanner and base your AI based on just the bare minimum, maybe even if it's noisy data to get, you know, uh, access to help to uh, the, the majority of people, uh, because then there could be a concern, for example, when you apply all these other layers, that kind of limits then the population that could benefit, you know, from that kind of information. Yeah, sure. And, and I think that's really good. I mean, if you look at some of the, the early um, successful applications of AI, right? So there's a ton of applications of AI in healthcare, but there's always a question about which ones are gonna be successful and helpful to patients. Um, from Stanford, again, you've got Subtle Medical, right? That came out and said, I'm gonna take a low resolution MR and I'm gonna make a high resolution image out of it, right? Something that AI can do because there's a lot of information left in the MR, really phenomenal use case that applies to everybody. Um, Hyperfine, another example that built the world's first mobile MR machine. For those who are not in the healthcare space, I'm probably not exaggerating if I say they put the MR machine first and then they build the hospital around it. It's that big. It's like multi-room thing. It's a massive installation and, you know, and, and, and probably you can attest to that. But I mean, it was phenomenal, phenomenal earlier in the year to see an MR machine being rolled down, right? That you can actually take to a child or you can take to an ICU patient. Um, and only possible because AI could extract enough information out of the noise in that in that image. Yeah, uh, that that's great. Something you you it seems like you have done everything for uh, in, as an infrastructure. So yeah. do you see anyone can go and do such platform that is different than yours? Because yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, everything is possible and I, I love the contribution of people. So one of the things that we, we did is we took all of the work that we've done, majority of it, and we open sourced it. So there is an open source version of all the engines that are inside of Clara, it's called Project One Eye. So we got together with all the leaders in the space that are working in AI and imaging and, and we built this open source project. So I would love for people to continue to contribute towards it. I mean, there's just so much still to be done. Um, and I think open source makes a lot of sense. It works for a lot of things, especially on the healthcare side. Yeah, that's really great promising that you have 750 companies working on the platform. That means 750 companies is changing the healthcare system. There's a yeah. lot of promising. And has this number changed before and after COVID or during COVID? The COVID hasn't passed yet. So we just discussed about the COVID and change in the space. What do you think about all this? Yeah, I think COVID is really interesting. And um, it really did a couple of things that were uh, phenomenal. So yes, it did change the field. So everybody who was working on, on AI, for example, in general, in, in radiology, um, has attempted right now to shift into working, figuring out solutions so that we can early detect COVID um, from imaging, right? So that's been really a focus. NVIDIA, in fact, worked with the NIH. We put out a model that's freely available. You can put a CT scan through it. It will tell you if you have COVID or not and locate it. So there's a lot of work there. There is a lot of work on prognostic as well predictions, right? So if I saw this, this COVID, um, can I actually predict what's going to happen to this patient? Is this patient going to really need to go and get hospitalized or not? Um, do I need to have a, a, you know, to intubate them? Do I need to do anything special for this patient or not? So there's a lot of work in that space. But I think there's also a lot of work required and happening on the precision health side. So if you think of companies um, like Tempest, right? Another amazing startup uh, that has done phenomenal 
So Tempest is doing a lot of COVID testing today, right now in, in Chicago, and they're creating databases. And their goal is to look at the genomic information and see if we can do the same prognostic prediction that this patient is gonna actually react well or not um, you know, to, to COVID, which is very, very, very important. Right, and, and I'll come back to this just in a second why it's important. But the, the third region that I'm seeing a lot of COVID activities where you actually have a lot of companies that are not necessarily in healthcare coming in is on the, what I would call smart camera applications and smart hospital enablement, right? So today, if you go into any place, you're getting scanned for your temperature and you know, you've got people and you're exposing them to risk. We're seeing a lot of, um, progress on, on the side of thermal cameras, right? Looking at you, determining where your pupil is, measuring the temperature in the pupil and saying, okay, your, your temperature is fine, please come in. But if you think of a smart camera inside of a hospital in the world of COVID, there's actually a lot more use cases. And, and it doesn't have to be just a smart camera, but you can now start thinking of a smart assistant where you're combining the camera with um, um, audio as well, speakers and, and, and so on. and and. First example, you go into an ICU, right? And you really want to reduce the interaction between the staff and somebody who's got COVID as much as possible. Turns out that cameras can do a lot of the things that you want, right? They can watch the breath rate of the of the physician of the patient. We can actually predict the heart rate. We can have seen examples where we can even measure blood pressure just using cameras, right? So a lot of use cases like that. The same camera can understand gestures from the patient who's sitting in there. Oh, I want water. I want, you know, instead of them touching things, right? And, and doing it, they can start requesting. Um, it can understand their language as an assistant. So we put all of this into something we call the Clara Guardian. And there's a lot of activity around it with tens of ISVs already producing great results um, in that space. So, so these are kind of the three ways that I see the world changing sort of on the diagnostic side and then more on the treatment side and then you know development of even drugs. I'm seeing a lot of activity there. And then just the new norm, right? Where you've got um, safe spaces. Um, you know, a, you really don't understand COVID until you've gone through it. And, and, and um, because we really don't know a lot about it, but um, in the last, month my wife came down with COVID and then two of our three boys came down with COVID as well and and I it really was interesting to me to watch it because um, for example while she came down with COVID um, I didn't get COVID I, I isolated with our kids and and two of the three boys had COVID I didn't know it for a week because the testing is just taking almost seven days today Right, which is really sad for our system because it takes about six hours to do the actual test, but we're just so overwhelmed. Um, so I actually isolated with two boys that had COVID um, and, and I still didn't get it, right? So I think what I, what I learned as I saw through this is number one, we need help on testing. So if any of you guys can think of ways that we can come in and help um, with testing, you should do it, right? Whether it's PCR or serology, we really need much faster testing. We need to increase our capacity. And I was really excited to see Quest um, talk about pooling for testing, which means they, they basically, instead of putting one patient in each um, uh, well, when they're running the actual PCR test, now they can put many patients. And if the whole group turns out to be negative, then everybody is negative. If that well turns out to be positive, then they retest every patient. It just increases our throughput. So there's smart ways. It's a method that was used for HIV testing. Um, and now they extended it to COVID. So really phenomenal. So I think what I learned is number one, we really need great testing. Number two, we, we really need precision health. Like I really want somebody to, to be able to explain to us, why is it that a wife would get it and a husband wouldn't, a son would get it and a father wouldn't. And it just is not clear today. And, and as a result, the society has gone into this, um, I'm gonna lock down everything today because, because there is 1% of people or a certain percentage of people that will get hurt really, really bad with COVID. And as a result, we've decided as a whole society that, okay, because I don't know, then everybody should go and protect. And I think we really need AI can help with that. The more that we learn about the patients that are getting sick, the more we're able to isolate them and help them specifically focus all our efforts on them rather than, you know, for a healthy person, you may not get it most of the time. If you did, it, you know, uh, my wife had fever for four or five days. I mean, it's really, it wasn't the end of the world. It's not pleasant and I'm sorry and I love her so much, but it's just, it, it, it's not 
something that that I think you know worth putting our whole economy at risk for right now, which is where we are. I think we have to study your family. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm all for healthcare, man. <laughs> That's great. So that goes to Ryan. Uh, I am curious. Google. Uh, I mean, Ryan involved with the Google baseline study with the Precision Center. And I'm just wondering, did they include any COVID things into like uh, their studies? Or have you have you heard that? Well, I mean, I, I guess when the study was initially launched in 2017, um, it wasn't a problem quite yet. But I know a lot of the tools that they and we've been developing have then kind of been used also to apply to, to the, the current pandemic. And um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they definitely have a lot of, I think what they've been doing is because there's so many opportunities, they've been kind of looking at, you know, doing a lot of the things that you're talking about, trying to dig into, and then partnering with um, different um, institutions that have expertise in these areas to try to even further uh, foster this. And, and they're, you know, they're thinking and using kind of distributed data approaches, kind of like we're talking about as well. Um, so absolutely. I mean, and then also kind of what I was going to talk about in terms of, you know, you mentioned precision health, which is something, you know, obviously we're very interested in. Um, you know, part of that is trying to, we try to keep people healthy. So, you know, for us, we're trying to keep people out of the hospitals if we can, if we can help it. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit, so you mentioned a little bit about, you know, some of the expertise and, you know, fully, you know, like autonomous driving and smart devices. Um, and, you know, you mentioned thermal cameras and sensors, you know, I'm thinking, you know, one of the, the thoughts we had was like, what if we had your car, but instead of using it, you know, focusing on, you know, applying the AI to drive the car by itself or, you know, mostly automated, can we then turn it back on the user? Is the user healthy? Do they have a temperature today? Are they stressed out? You know, I, I wonder, you know, and then you can extend that to the population level as well. You know, smart, we think of smart homes, smart cities, all of these sensors, like you said, they're embedded already, or we can easily input them and gather even more data. So you can imagine intercepting these people very early on and then getting this, this continuum of data, which would help us build the better risk model. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what, what kind of thoughts do you have in those regards and kind of any initiatives you might have that might complement some of these efforts? Yeah, I think it's it's really important actually. And, and the one of the most amazing things that we have at NVIDIA is we're architected as a horizontal company. So everything that I'm telling you guys today about Clara is 10% personalized for healthcare, 90% genetic across every industry. So actually I share a lot from self-driving when I do when I do our work, right? When we're building Clara, we actually pick a lot from that industry, from robotics, from what's happening in manufacturing and you bring it all together and you customize it for healthcare, right? So when you're talking about the, the when you're describing what you just said, in fact, one of the first things we did, the temperature control, the temperature sensing, and uh, we actually got, and the heart rate monitoring, we got from our self-driving team. That model that we put out for healthcare, we got from our self-driving team because what they did is they, you have a camera inside of the car that's watching the driver all the time. And you want to know that the driver is awake, that they, they're not having any health issues. So that was actually a necessary thing for them to build, um, to do this. I truly believe in it. I think it should start in your bed and then your mirror and then your bathroom and then your car. And, and that's how you're going to be able to alert me as soon as possible to something happening. Um, of course, that's going to end up generating massive amounts of data. Um, so it's going to pose a challenge into how do I actually extract information out of all of the, uh, this data. The beauty of it is, as you know, and there was a couple of questions on the chat, and I'm really sorry I'm not able to catch up with it. This conversation is very engaging, but there's a lot of questions about, um, you know, the, the, the tools and the data and, and what's happening. And it's really what I described to you guys as the computer learning from itself is what people call deep learning. And I realize some of the folks here are in healthcare, so they're not familiar with it. But it, it's just, you know, people think of artificial intelligence as this big umbrella of, oh, we've got artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence, a general definition of it is the computer being able to do what a human can do, right? Meaning 
you're going to pose a problem to me. I'm going to go analyze it. I'm going to go think about what areas I need to go learn about. And then I'm going to go learn about these areas. I'm going to put this information all together and produce an answer to you. Computers cannot do that. Computers cannot do that today. We don't have that. What we have is a subset of, of functionality called machine learning, right? Which is the computer being able to learn something. Almost everybody on this call has done machine learning. If you've ever opened Excel and, and did a regression table, if you've ever put numbers and tried to create a chart out of them, extrapolate information, that's machine learning, essentially. You, you've got some data points, you're trying to predict um, the missing data points. One of the models of machine learning ways that machine learning happens is called deep learning. And it's based on roughly neural networks of the brain, right? So you create this fresh network, fresh brain, and you show it things and start creating connections between things that are related to each other. That's how the computer generally learns. So I think with deep learning, we're gonna be able to show it large amounts of data, right? And it's gonna be able to at least cluster them for us, right? And say, okay, these patients seem similar. Right? These patients seem similar, which allows us now for novel discoveries, right? Of things that are connected, right? It's still hard. Like today, most of the AI that we're seeing is in the supervised area. But if you supervise, meaning I actually know what I want to teach the computer, right? Like I know this person is diseased. But what if I didn't? What if I had all of the sensor data and I really didn't know what to make out of these signals or what do they mean? It still actually is very helpful. There's still a lot of work on the unsupervised side of it where it's going to be able to sort of cluster patients and they're like, well, okay, these got clustered together. Let me go and analyze them now and see what I can learn. Maybe I can actually put a label as an expert in the field. I know that these guys all have this. So you put it on and then the computer can start learning more. I, I really love that space. I think it's needed. I think when we're going to succeed in precision medicine is when, when, when we have the, the data available and digitized in a great manner, right? In a way that we can actually receive it. Like for example, pathology is not there. It's not digitized yet. Physicians, believe it or not, still look at glass slides for the most part. At least 95% of them do. So we need digitized data, right? Which is getting created very quickly. I think we need a, a simulation or a model of the human. Right, and, and this work is not new. I mean, Archimedes was one of the first examples uh, that the Kaiser Foundation sort of put together um, that showed that you can actually create a model, a, a, call it a digital twin of a human being, right? Where you're able, you know, every time I take a test, it gets inserted into my twin. Every time I take an image, it gets inserted into my twin. Every time, you know, I have something irregular with my heartbeat, it gets inserted into my twin. An AI can, can, can start feeding into this thing. And then if you've actually created it, now you can start testing this model, right? And, and it's not, again, it's not science fiction. I mean, one of the things I did at Stanford was um, with Professor Taylor, we were doing cardiovascular engineering, where we modeled the cardiovascular system of, of a child, right? Including everything, the physiology of it, the biology of it. Now you've got this model and, and the, the patient has a congenital heart disease, right? So there's something wrong with their heart. Instead of the pediatric cardiac surgeon going in and actually doing the surgery in real and then figuring out that, oh, this didn't work or this worked, you can use that model, the simulation, to actually do the surgery and test 15 different kinds of surgeries. And then because you've modeled the physiology of that patient combined with their imaging, it's like it actually is a cardiovascular system of the patient to 90% accuracy. You can really predict what's gonna happen and end up choosing the right treatment for it. This is not science fiction, guys. This is like true um, stuff that we can, we can do today. It's just, I think AI is needed to create these models, right? You need the data, you need the AI to pull the information out of it. And then we end up creating this model and we, we just simulate. So I think AI simulation, data science, they need to come together for us to do precision health. Um, another question I had was in regards to, you know, the current, uh, you know, majority use of AI is where you have a series, let's say, especially in radiology, you have images and you may be tracking a lesion over time. The, usually the patients had the scan because they had an initial test. You know, we know for certain cancers, and this gets to one of the community's questions here is about, you know, cancer prediction, for example. And you mentioned glioblastoma, you know, which is something that, you know, I, I you know, uh, do research on. I see patients with, you know, glioblastoma in the clinic. And unfortunately, um, just as with glioblastoma, you talk about pancreatic cancer as well. Sometimes the first scan is the diagnostic scan because there's no screening for glioblastoma or pancreatic cancer. 
There are no known major modifiable risk factors. We just don't have a way to predict these types of diseases that present in their late stages. And you know, that, that's why we have a poor prognosis. Is there any way to kind of, rather than prospectively collecting lots of data looking forward, can we tell the AI algorithm, this patient has glioblastoma, or this patient has pancreatic cancer, look backwards now through their entire medical history and tell us what we could have done earlier, predict or learn something, um, you know, yeah. because it's uh, such a, uh, it's the, what I consider some of these orphan cancers where we don't really have any good screening tools or any ways to, you know, to have early detection. Yeah, I think number one is I hope that medicine changes, right? Like with these tools, I mean, we, Medicine and the way it's practiced and the standard, um, you know, recommended procedures that we do and, and standard practice is really based on the current tools that we have today. So, so that's why I think it is what it is. And if we end up creating these um, early predictors that are just computerized and they're looking and say, oh, watch for this, then, then we'll win. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, Joel Dudley. Joel Dudley um, and Ryan, you might be familiar with him because he, he ran Precision Health at Mount Sinai. Um, He's currently at Tempest, but he put out some of the most interesting work, a project called Deep Patient. Read all of the, the, the historic information that they had access to for their patients at Mount Sinai, created an AI model that can predict 80 diseases, 80 diseases about a year early. Some of them like liver cancer, 95% accuracy a year early. Right. So, so the information is there, right? It's just, and, and by the way, if you went to like this super physician, if you were so lucky, right, that you went to the expert in liver cancer, right, and, and you found them and they're, you know, at Stanford or at Harvard and, and, you know, you had a good friend that made an introduction, you got on their schedule, they'll probably tell you that. Like they can look at your stuff because they've seen so many patients. That's what we focus on, right? That's how we actually dealt with cancer is we just became super specialized, right? they'll be able to tell you that information. It's in their head, but how do you then disseminate it to the rest of the world? I mean, they only have, you know, I don't know, they work 12 hours a day, seven to seven, but not enough, right? Like the population is just massive. And I think AI gives, gives these physicians the ability to, hey, I'm gonna take whatever you've learned and I'm gonna codify it. And now, you know, I can actually make it available to everybody who's got this question without taking away from your time dealing with your own patients, but your goodness is actually now distributed to everybody else. And I, and I think that's something that I really, really like. The population health and, and global access to healthcare is very important. So we are getting great questions from community. There are yeah. a lot. And I, we try to uh, summarize and get yes. it to you. If Ryan and Shah can help, it would be great. There are two of them I like to say, I was curious about. First is, is your algorithms, uh, they are FDA approved and how does FDA work on that? Yeah, so the algorithms that we're creating are not FDA approved, right? We have no desire of, of doing FDA approval. So at NVIDIA, what we wanna do is, we wanna show people how to create AI, right? So I'll give you the tools to create something. And then I'm gonna show you an example of how it's done using our AIs, right? So. Um, we create the platform, for example, one thing that we built specifically for healthcare and FDA is determinism. It turns out that AI by nature is not deterministic. If you train the same network on the same exact data using the same exact infrastructure, the first time you train it, it will give you 99.2% accuracy. The second time you train it, it will give you 99.22 accuracy. Not a problem for anybody, great. It's a problem for the FDA. You cannot reproduce the algorithm that you've, you've actually said you had, right? So we built ways that you can build determinism in there. So, um, and FDA is changing by the way, the way that they're thinking, because again, if you go back to the previous model before, before deep learning, the algorithms were static. Like you could actually just test it on this population and everything looks great. Okay, fine. Our knowledge is not gonna change that fast. The algorithm is not gonna change that fast. But if you truly believe in the world of AI and deep learning, which by the way, as of today, 90, over 90% 90 of published research in imaging is using deep learning. So it's working, right? There's over, um, I think 8 billion last time I checked in, in funding that's been raised by the startups in this space. So it's coming. So if you believe in AI, then you what you believed in is a world where a computer can learn. If that is true, and I believe in a world where a computer can learn, and, and it's a computer that's sitting next to me and I'm a physician and it gave me a suggestion that I think is wrong, then it better learn from me, 
right? So I believe that the AI will continue to evolve. I think the rate at which AI will, will evolve, um, at least initially, will be very high. So we need the capability to not just put the AI in, but actually be able to update it, right? Constantly, right? Continuous learning is, is sort of the term that's used in the industry. For the FDA, this is a nightmare, right? It's like, how do you qualify something like this? What do we do with it? But they've been amazingly engaged with the community. And I've worked with them on a couple of instances. A lot of experts have. And, and essentially, what the direction that they're going is, listen, we're going to actually go verify the method by which you're creating your AI. Okay, we're going to go verify your data sources. And if we think that these things are, are sort of approved, then we're going to let the model go into the wild. And, and when, when it's in the wild, we're going to actually have continuous monitoring of the performance of this model. And at any point, you can stop it and say, no, this is not approved. But it's like now you've allowed these things to come in at a high rapid rate and then, and then make its way. And of course, we have to really be careful. I mean, at the end of the world, it's patients and it's our families that are going to go through it. So it's a high responsibility on the FDA today. And I really appreciate everything they do. But these are some of the things they're thinking through. So that also answers the question of job security for Shirag and his uh, colleagues, medical doctors. <laughs> well, well, I was going to say, I, I think you're totally right because there was this whole concern about, you know, teleradiology, teledermatology, telepathology, et cetera. But I think, as you said, Abdul, it's, you're right on, on the mark there with this is something that's going to help us reduce errors. You know, why should the pathologist scan the entire glass slide when an AI can just say, look at this area of the slide and this is your highest potential for making a diagnosis, let's move on then to the next slide. I, I think that's totally right. Yeah. It's a very great assistive technology and it will be tailored to the individual type of clinician's needs. And I think that's a wonderful uh, potential yeah. for this uh, technology. Yeah. And, and I think it goes back also to the, to the need. I mean, we have a massive shortage. And, and when I say that, people say, oh no, I've got access to a lot of physicians. Again, if we go back to the first art discussion we had, which is in order to treat cancer and disease, physicians have had to specialize, right? So the best decision you're gonna get from, you know, the person who's seeing 90% uh, GI cases is gonna be the best person, right? And so and Chirag, you're the glioplastoma expert, right? 90% of the population of physicians cannot specialize because they're, they're treating the rest of the population. They have to be able to answer all sorts of diseases. So we have a shortage of experts, right? And, and I really would rather have each one of our physicians have the ability to consult and say, okay, is this a really good case or not? But it's not a scalable model if it's a human being that I have to constantly consult, right? So that's sort of one model that you can imagine where there's a massive need. I think there's a massive need in, in recognizing, it, it really shocked me. Like you've got 45 radiologists in some countries in Africa, the whole country. We've got more than that at Stanford. I mean, it's just, it's really amazing. I mean, our global impact, and I think as, as people that are in healthcare that are thinking about how do we contribute to the society, there's nothing to worry about here. The use cases that, that AI is gonna help with are can I take away some of the mundane stuff? Can I enable you to do something like you couldn't before? For example, all glioblastoma, I can tell now it's an MGMT methylation. So this is the best medication that I'm gonna give you to it. Can I actually help you scale and, and go answer questions from your colleague who you know is in a little town in Arkansas? Or can I actually take it all the way to Syria where there's somebody on the field that needs a consultation? They have no access to a physician. What do you do? Right? There, like there's a need, humanity needs this to happen. Yes, and great. Actually, we are uh, we are over time. Uh, uh, there are some special questions about Clara, where that yeah. open source uh, uh, open source software is. Uh, yeah, Google Nvidia Clara, Nvidia yeah. Clara, okay. and and you'll find all of it. The the uh, so Nvidia Clara. I'm gonna put it in the chat. And then the open source project is called Monai, M O N A I, also for the chat. Okay, thank you. So um, there are a lot of good questions, and we try to cover in our next sessions. Really uh, appreciate your time, and I I love this 
talk series and people actually drop rate is really low compared to all other our events. People are really engaging and we are actually keeping those questions and we keep those questions as more general. We can ask our next speakers, hope to maybe invite Abdul and maybe another time, which March, we, we maybe fire more doctors at that time. <laughs> I'll, I'll be off and then Abdul will bring his colleague from NVIDIA. How about that? <laughs> no, no, AI. no we're close. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Abdul. It was a really great conversation. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. I truly enjoyed it. <laughs> Take care, guys. Okay. Take care. Take care. Okay, bye. bye.